Hi, welcome to City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. Your Honor, welcome. Good to see you. Hey, Walt. It's great to see you. Yeah, here on these waning days of winter, huh? With the sunshine lasting a little bit longer. I think we, don't we change time this weekend or next weekend? I think it's next weekend, so. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, I'm coming up. It's coming up. One of these weekends soon. I think it's, yeah. I think it's a week from Saturday night. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Well, um, l- let's kind of talk about the, the topic that's been on the top of everybody's list uh, uh, for the last year or so. And that's a, you know, a COVID update. Maybe you can tell us, I know the city is doing some testing and, you know, yeah. everybody's trying to get a shot and, and worry about the availability. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in Beverly uh, along that regard, Mike? Yeah, sure. We, we, uh, we offered some testing clinics last week. And we didn't get a lot of interest. We did two days for staff, um, staff and family members, and then we did two days at uh, outside of um, the high school as a drive-through for the public. And between right. the four clinics, we got about 460-ish um, people, and we had eight positives. You do the math; it was about one and two thirds percent positive, and that's good. That that's a real good, you know, that shows yeah. well. Um, it's consistent. The, you know, the, the, the new positives have been very low. Um, but I will encourage people to keep getting tested. I don't know if we're going to offer any more in the near future, you know, but the stop the spread sites in Salem are still there. Uh, and I know one of the things that, that health experts are concerned with is that people are just not getting tested. And so we won't catch transmission. I mean, clearly, and it's understandable, everybody's focus is on getting vaccinated. That's what everybody wants. Yeah. So. yeah. Tell, tell us about the vaccination sites here in Beverly. I know I had quite a hard time getting on the state site to, to schedule something. What, what's happening now here in Beverly? Sure. So we're, we have a pending regional application um, that we're hoping to hear from the state on in the next handful of days. Um, the state invited cities and towns to band together to regionally vaccinate our first responders our police, fire, uh, ambulance. And that was a, gosh, already a month and a half ago, at least. Uh, So we partnered up with Danvers, Salem, Swampscott and Marblehead, and we did that. And our health departments really, you know, ran the show together. Um, So working with that regional, we then after that got a couple of rounds of doses from the state. We held a number of clinics, some at Salem State uh, University campus, some in the, com- the other communities. We had one at the senior center a couple of weeks ago, and I think we've got, we've got a second dose round for those same folks coming up. But shortly after we started kind of going community by community and, and hosting local uh, clinics, the state said a few weeks ago, we're not gonna give you local clinics anything more because there aren't enough doses and we're gonna focus them on the mass vaccination sites those handful of bigger sites, closest one to us being over on the other side of Danvers by the Middleton line um, at the Danvers Doubletree Hotel site. Right. So, you know, they, they put the, put the brakes on that um, on our local stuff. We since keep pushing for them to designate our five communities as a regional so that we can at least at Salem state offer clinics regionally. And and that will be another opportunity for Beverly people closer to home. Um, then there are the drug stores that are doing the federal pharmacy program. They get their doses straight from the federal government. So that's a separate system. Um, mm-hmm. And CVS has not to date opened one at one of their Beverly stores. And I've been asking them to please do so. They notified me yesterday that they are going to, in the next two to three weeks, open a site in Beverly. So now we're trying to determine which, which of the two which CVS one, yeah. stores works best. So mm-hmm. that's coming. Um, the hospital system was asked by the state to stand up sites for their primary care patients. And so Beverly Hospital came to us and they set up a site at the Tory Rocky Post. That went great. And then the state paused that again, because the, the number of doses coming from the federal government was so limited, but they've reopened the hospital site. So Beverly Hospital is now doing that again. The way they're handling it, the hospital, since so many people are eligible within their, you know, their primary care uh, system, they're using a lottery system, which I think makes sense. Draw names and then when they get them, they notify people directly. So it's not that kind of free for all that goes on with the state website. 
where you find out there, there's a clinic going to happen next week over at the mass vaccination site and everybody goes and tries to get an appointment. So, I mean, that's still happening with the mass sites, but the hospital's doing it a little differently. That's fine too. Um, and we're, as, as municipal leaders, we're working with you know, mayors and town managers all over the region. We're trying to help set up the best infrastructure we can for when there are more doses coming from the federal government. Right. That's why we're trying to get this regional and Salem state approved. Uh, we still want doses coming right to the Beverly Health Department. I think that'll happen again when there are enough doses coming from the state, but it's not going to be for a little bit longer. Um, good that CVS is going to open up one in Beverly in the next couple, couple two to three weeks. And, you know, we, we're, we're hoping that'll happen sooner than later. But that's that's kind of the landscape. You know, it's it's people 65 and over, plus people with two comorbidities. And then as of yesterday, the governor said educators are now also eligible. And so there are a lot of people scrambling for not enough doses. Yeah. Just to give a context, for the last two to three weeks in a row, the state has received 140,000 new doses each week. That happened right after they made over a million people newly eligible in that 65 and over plus yeah. two comorbidities yeah. group. Yeah. Now by adding educators, there's another several hundred thousand. Yeah. And when you say that, okay, Massachusetts is going to get 140,000 in new doses this week, some of them, I don't know what percentage, maybe half, are already tied up in already scheduled second dose clinics, right, yeah. for somebody who got their first dose a few weeks ago. So it's going to be a little bit yet. The federal government has asked the state and city leaders, we've all been in meetings, we, they've said, please be patient with us in another couple of weeks we believe we'll able to for, be, be able to forecast out further than a couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, so, and I know they're working hard at the federal level to really ramp that manufacturing up. You saw just the other day that Merck Pharmaceutical has got a deal now to help manufacture the J&J &J vaccine. So that's mm -hmm. gonna help Johnson & Johnson really ramp up theirs. So, you know, I, I think everybody's efforts are in the same direction. It's, yeah. you know, and now we're hearing you know, end of May for everybody to have access. We were before it had been end of July. Yeah. Um, you know, end of March is a goal to have first dose for every every teacher. You know, I mean that, that's I hope so because you know we're we're all uh, we're all feeling the need for the kids to be in school more. The kids are desperately you know, desperately needing more uh, than they're getting. It just makes sense to have the teachers. You know, you're gonna you're gonna send whole school for kids and, and the teachers aren't vaccinated. It doesn't make sense. You know. Have you had your vaccination yourself, Mike? No, I um, I, I I mean, I I have one comorbidity. I have asthma. I thought I had two, but the CDC didn't agree with me when I looked at their website. Um, so I I'm in that one comorbidity group. I think there are a couple of groups down from here. Yeah. I think another million or a million and a half more people are going to get theirs before me. But hey, that's all right. You know, we, we all just that brings me to the next point. We all have to keep doing what we've been trying to do for a year. You know, wearing masks, keeping a distance, trying to do, um, you know, trying to do things as safely as we can. Um, the, con the, the transmission by contact is less of a concern than by air, but you still got to wash your hands and pay attention to all that. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's about trying to continue to be thoughtful and careful and minimize what you do that you don't have to do. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, in, in the last couple of weeks here, last couple of days, there's been a lot of talk about a lot of states uh, and areas in the country opening back up again. Businesses opening up full scale, no yep. masks and everything. What what sort of what what position do you think as as you know as Beverly's chief executive? What what's your position as to as to that kind of uh, you know pro proceeding in that in that way? Well, I have concerns. You know, I mean these these decisions have been made at the state level. Um, I understand them. I understand the pressures on, on, on business and you know, people trying to hang on economically through to the end of the pandemic. Um, so I, mean, I, I don't wanna bang the table. I, uh, I, I don't fully agree with, uh, you know, with the easing of what, you know, what's going on um, with the economy right now. But um, you know, since it's happening, it's not my decision. I'm hoping that things go well and, and you know everybody stays healthy. Well, let's let's talk about some of the things that have been going around. You know, with this COVID and everything being the top of the list of things to talk about. There's a lot of activity going on in in Beverly. Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, maybe we, we can talk about some of the infrastructure things, the things that we mm -hmm. happen, maybe some of the things that aren't happening yet, like, uh, you know, what maybe the, the police station, and maybe you can mention that and, and what's happening over at the old McDonald's uh, site. Maybe you can give us a little yeah. bit of those. Yeah. Uh, so the police station, uh, you know, it's exciting. It's, a, it's an exciting project. Police have been in the station they've got for close to 100 years. Um, if you look back at the history of, of City Hall, that was initially the, the, the carriage house and stables for the estate, the old Cabot estate, which became the, the Thorndike estate, which became City Hall. Uh, I mean, the police station's old. In fairness, the police probably outgrew the space a generation ago. Um, it's, it's been very needed for some time and, and it's happening. And I'm excited for, you know, for the community. It's a, it's a facility that will meet their needs. It's about a 30, 32,000 square foot station where they currently are working in about 8,000 to 10,000 square feet. So, you know, it, it's, it, it meets the needs of, 20, of a 21st century police department. Uh, we also are going to be moving our complete uh, 911 dispatch system over there. Right now, we have two separate systems, police and fire, and they're going to be they're going to be consolidated and, and moved over there. So that's an exciting piece as well. Um, the goal is to move the move everybody in by the end of the summer, and I believe we're on target to do so. The you know we've we've got a, a great team that's been uh, that designed and is building the station for us. It also, and you've heard me say this. We're trying to build a net zero station, meaning a station that's not going to emit greenhouse gases. Now, it'll probably be initially be a, a near net zero, um, and we hope eventually it'll be net zero when, when battery storage improves for the solar piece. But we're using a geothermal system of 30 some odd 500 foot uh, you know, pits that were, that were dug with, with a piping system was where water goes down right, and comes yeah. back up. And, um, and, in, and, and the, the Ground temperature year round is constant when you get far enough underground. Right. And so that temperature will mean that the water running through coming back into the building will cool the building in the summer and heat the building in the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, we're putting solar on the rooftop and as a canopy over the parking lot. So those are ways in which, and, and, and as a building that's open 24 hours a day, every day of the year, the ability to have that building be, uh, you know, have a net, a net zero footprint, carbon footprint is, is a huge uh, boon yeah. to the whole community. Yeah. Uh, you asked about One Water yeah. Street, what, you, you, wanna, you wanna tell me what you know? Well, <laughs> I know that the building's finally been torn down and uh, I know, I, I'm not sure they're, if they're actually putting, if there's any been shovels put in the ground yet or not, maybe. Yeah, yeah no, that, thanks for bringing it up. So One Water Street is the old McDonald's building down at the mm -hmm. Harbor Fund. Um, we, Everybody knows that you know the city's been trying to get that redeveloped for 20 plus years, and uh, and it's always been the vision has always been a restaurant with some publicly accessible space involved in in, in the footprint, um, and you know a way to activate the waterfront and help people enjoy it. Um, you know one important thing to us all along has been that there be a a, a takeout uh, window on the first floor that'll be open during you know most of uh, really all the good weather months, not necessarily year round. And then a, a sit down indoor restaurant. Um, and we did tear down the building. That was part of the agreement the city put in the, in the RFP when we, when we bid the project out. Um, and the developer is a man named Marty Bloom and the rest, Beverly Restaurant Association, which um, he owns Mission on the Bay in Swampscott, right over in the Swampscott Lynn line. And he owns Mission Oak Grill up in downtown Newburyport. He also is part owner of a couple of restaurants in Boston in the South End. Um, very experienced veteran restaurant owner. He's been in this business for decades. He is the partner that was going to make this work. We had a lot of people look at this and not, not see their way to be able to do it. Um, and, you know, so he was ready to go a couple of years ago and, and, and then COVID hit. Well, you know, yeah. he was ready to get started and, and then COVID hit as he was gearing up. So it's, it's just knocked everything back a year. So at present, all the permitting's in place, the building's down. The plan is that he's gonna start construction late spring, early summer, with a goal of opening in the summer of 2022. That's a year later than he initially had yeah. hoped to open, but it's, it's certainly understandable. And yeah. the fact that he's still at the table and he's determined and committed to the project is, you know, makes, us, makes us happy. I mean, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there has been 
a need for and a desire from people all over Beverly and from around the region to be able to go sit out at the waterfront and have a bite to eat and enjoy, you know, enjoy friends for decades. Yeah. And, you know, yes, we're in COVID now, but remember as people, we, we love to gather, we love to, to share food and drink and <laughs> it's a natural. So there'll be a time. And, and, you know, the fact that they're looking to open a year from now, a year from summer, we, you know, we'll be, well beyond COVID, and that'll be a great thing. Now, let me ask you, to, speaking about the waterfront, the, the, the dredging of the Bass River, that was ready to start. They had the barges out there and so forth like about a year and a half ago or so. And then they hmm. took additional samples and somehow the samples were higher uh, in toxins than they thought and that thing was just abruptly stopped. So what, what is the status of that now, Mike? Yeah, that, so the, the Bass River hasn't been dredged in almost 70 years, desperately needs it, both for the commercial fishermen on the river and, uh, you know, any rec there's both commercial and recreational boating. Uh, and, and so it's been needed a long time. We thought we had it sorted. The state was going to pay half the dredging cost. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers had approved our permit. And so we all thought we were ready to go. In fact, we relied on that Army Corps permit. So did the state. Um, and then at the very last minute, literally, we, you know, we had a contractor who, you know, responded to our bid. We, you know, we signed a contract with them. They came up here to get started. And then the state wouldn't give us the coordinates as to where to go dump the material out at the, at the deep water dump site that, the, that they operate. Um, and, and so we started calling the Army Corps a year ago, December, and we said, where are the coordinates? Don't know, don't know, don't know. And then finally we got somebody who said, well, we're not going to give you the coordinates. So what do you mean? They said, we never should have awarded you the permit. We messed up and we're rescinding the permit. Oh. So the Army Corps, was, you know, they admitted that they had, it's, it's, a, it's a tough story because we've borne the brunt of it, right, as, as, a, oh. as a community. Their people shouldn't have awarded the permit based on the data. The data hadn't changed. They interpreted or read it wrongly unfortunately. So anyway, um, we've been looking for a, a, another way to do the project. And we recently were uh, applied for and got a grant from the state to do a feasibility study on whether we can create a CAD cell. Yeah. CAD cell is a, is a, I forget what the letters stand for, but it's simply this. The sediment at the bottom of the river that in the channel that we need to dredge is contaminated. It's inert in the river bottom, but when we put, when we, you know, when we pick it up, it's problematic. So where can you put it? So with a CAD cell, what you do is you find a space that the bedrock's far enough below the, the bed of the river or the ocean. And you go into that space and you excavate out 40, 50, 100 feet, whatever, under the riverbed. You pull out all this, you know, you, you, you kind of stabilize it. Then you pull out all the clean soil and you can dump that anywhere and you create this cavity to then put the contaminated soil, put it under the ground, under the, you know, under the surface of the riverbed, there's a cushion of space, and then you lock it in there. We're, we're doing a feasibility study to see if that'll work. Uh, if it can, then we start looking at a larger project that, that involves the cost of creating that. And we'll have to start searching for various grant funding opportunities uh, in, in hopes that the project can happen sometime in the next several years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, uh, can I talk about streets? Yes, please do. I, that's going to be my next question. <laughs> just, just quickly, because there's a lot going on and, and you think it's winter. Why is there construction? Why are the streets open? NUCO, which is the contractor for National Grid, they're, they need periodically on a regular basis to upgrade their gas infrastructure below the street that services, you know, people's homes and businesses for heating. So, um, so we allow them to work in the winter. Not all communities do. We find that they can get a lot done and it's, it keeps things flowing. Right. And, and it's, it's an, in an off time from other typical road construction. We also, and this is a credit to Mike Collins, our commissioner of public services, He's worked with them for years and set up a model that other communities are trying to follow, where we work with them very carefully and closely throughout the year, year in and year out. So they know what road projects we're going to do. And we say to them, look, if you're going to replace a gas service, here are the streets we're doing in the next couple of years. 
you need to come do your work before we do ours. Because yeah. if we do a new road surface, we don't want you coming in and telling us and that you're after to do it, that you got to cut into it to, you know, for your work. So we, we try to do that. And we try to do our own water and sewer uh, upgrade work in the same way. Try to be holistic about it. So yeah. the, the, the gas company, in some cases, because there's a bad leak in their system or they've had an emergency, and in other cases, because they know we're planning to do work somewhere. They, they do a lot of work in, in town. We also are, are in a multi-year project to deal with our sewer lines. And this is, and this is interesting because I, I was the state representative. I had just taken office in 1993 at the time when at the state level and the federal level, we were trying to get um, money to help build the new sewage treatment plant over in Salem. We only had a primary treatment plant at that time. We needed a secondary plant so that we would clean up to a greater degree the sewage before letting it out in the outfall pipe off of, off of Marblehead. So in order to keep the cost down, the federal government allowed the district, which includes Beverly and four other communities, to build a bit smaller plant because we all committed to doing this work to deal with inflow and infiltration. Yeah. Trying to make sure that our sewer mains, that our sewer lines all through the city didn't have cracks and holes in them that allowed groundwater in and didn't have illegal connections where people, for example, hooked up, you know, hooked up a, a sump pump and, and they shouldn't have. So that kind of work is another whole big project that involves among other things, uh, lining all the sewer lines all over the city. So we've been doing that work for a number of years. People know it's coming, if it's coming to their neighborhood, they get outreach from the contractor and the process, you know, they, they work through a neighborhood, uh, you know, a couple of neighborhoods a year. So. Mm -hmm. That's going on all over town year in and year out. There's just, a, you know, there's a lot going on, I guess. Well, I mean, there we, is. We don't have we don't that much time left, Michael, but let us let me ask you this. You know, everybody's looking to get back to normal and kind of everybody's looking, it's it's early spring now where it's gonna be spring pretty quickly. Um, what, what does the summer look like for, you know, the rec de department, the homecoming, the parks, the beaches, yep. Yep. things like that? So yeah, a couple of things. Um, we very much hope that this summer is going to be a lot more like people are used to, right? And, and so we're, we're, we're planning in the alternative. For example, the recreation department just did their, um, their sign up, which they ran as, as a lottery for, for fairness for the summer camps at, at Lynch Park. We only populated those camps to the levels the state allowed last year. But we told people, look, we're almost certain that we're going to be able to do a lot more than that. I mean, you know, you look, I mean, school's in session all over, you know, and, and there are a lot more things that we're able to do. And we're going to be almost fully vaccinated by summer. So we are almost certain that we'll do a lot more and we'll figure that out in the coming weeks. Um, along with that, we're, you know, we think we're not going to have any problem holding our summer concert series. But so we're starting to line that up but we won't be able to make final decisions for a little bit yet. So those, you know, people can hope to see more of what they're used to. And, and the, you know, the tale will be told in the coming weeks and months and how, how we progress against the virus. But I'm very hopeful that there'll be a lot more. And that, you know, I, I've got to talk with the homecoming committee because they're in the process of planning. And the question is, yes, I think we're all going to be able to do quite a bit more. Does that mean that, you know, that, that the, the training wheels are fully off or does it mean, a lot more than last year, but maybe not entirely exactly what we did two years ago. But we'll, we'll find our way. And I, I think it'll just provide a lot more opportunity for people to get out and enjoy the good weather and see each other and be more, you know, more social and really get caught up with each other. Yeah. Not, not having homecoming and not having Lynch Park to go to last summer kind of hurt. But I think the city's idea that you came up with having that concert series in front of the Beverly High School there, that, mm -hmm. that him was able to, to, uh, uh, yeah, to that's true. Oh, one other story. thing, you know, Memorial Day ceremonies on, on Memorial Day, we're you know, working with the Veterans Commission, but we're very hopeful that we'll be able to do an in-person outdoor, you know, give, given, you know, depending on the weather. Um, and, you know, I think we can do it as in, you know, we, we may try to choose a different venue than we usually use in order to space out better. But, um, you know, we're, we're working on that as well. How much time do we have left, Walt? Very, very little, Mike. You want to say something? You want to uh, go ahead. You got a couple minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I do want to share. There's another project we're trying to accomplish this summer, 
and that's to replace the, uh, the the turf field at Beverly High School. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And and you know we're we're pushing to and and you know the city council's considering it uh, at my request. And if if it gets approved, we're hoping to have it built this summer because here's the thing. We have two turf fields in Beverly now, the middle school and the high school. And any community of any size for their youth sports and their school sports absolutely has to have these. And here's why. We have several thousand kids and adults who utilize the two turf fields we have. And in the, in the late fall and in the early spring, you just flat out can't run your programs without them. And then the rest of the year, you know, you can, you can play on turf when the weather's bad, where you can't play on grass without really damaging the field. And you can play right after a storm when you might have to wait a day or two with a grass field that doesn't drain well. For example, right. some of the grass fields at the high school, which are on, you know, it's, it's clay under surface. So that, that's tough drainage wise. We did a study, or I shouldn't say we did, a study was done that we were able to, to, to take advantage of. Um, looking at grass and turf fields in New England and comparing their utility. And we found that 1,400 hours a year for an artificial, artificial turf field usage, 500 hours a year for a grass field. Those were the comparisons. Wow. So you get roughly three times as many hours out of a turf field in a given year than a grass field. Yeah. And, and as I said, with, you know, with all kinds of youth programs and all the school programs, and then all the informal use, Groups of friends, individuals, families, you, you look at those fields on any given day of, of the year, unless except the most frozen part of winter, and people are out there enjoying them. Um, and the fields, you know, they, they have a lifespan of about eight to 12 years. And we're looking, you know, we're about to start year 11. Well, we're doing it. The football team's already out there in their, their unique fall two season that started a, a week ago. So it's just an asset that we absolutely need to have given the many, many, many people who utilize and take advantage. And, you know, all those active activities, you know, informal, individual, you know, organized team, they just couldn't happen in anywhere near the way they do for people without that asset. So it's an important piece to, to our overall, um, you know, set of infrastructure and, and, and resources for the community. Yeah, well, uh, you know, and I, one of the things I, I was surprised to learn that those uh, turf fields only last about, like you said, eight to 10 years yeah. and eight to 12. And when I thought about it, we put that in in 2010. So th right. that span is right. expired. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that. But, uh, that's but, but, if, but if you remember that it, they're good for three times as many hours, yeah, then you kind of think of it, well, instead of eight to 12, it's 24 to 36 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a, or you could say, the cost, which we're estimating at about 750,000, really gives you three fields yeah. in that sense. And, and the other thing about grass is, look, I love grass. I love playing on it. I love coaching on it. Uh, but at a certain point, not just weather-wise, but you start beating on it too much and you wear it out. Yeah. You know, we have, out at, out at the airport, we have a beautiful facility of grass fields, essentially three fields. And we, we typically rest one field every season and use the other two and rotate that. Yeah, and that's really the way you handle grass. So, yeah, yeah we're we're excited and, ho and hopeful this can be done. Yeah. Well, uh, you speaking about the kids practicing, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows that the uh, the football season has been pushed back to now, and it's the varsity is only going to play seven games, and then there won't be any playoffs. But I think the first game is is a week from this coming Saturday. We're sitting here; it's a Thursday evening, early evening, uh, yeah. and Bev Cam will be out there. Uh, at because the, they're not going to play the games at at, at Herb, they're going to play them at the at the high school in the turf. Right. We're planning to to uh, thanks to our uh, Robert Dokes, uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to broadcast those games. Live. I'm excited for the kids and, and the volleyball uh, volleyball season is going as well as the indoor track. Right, so. and we we broadcast all of the home uh, basketball games as well. So that that went. That went and then the regular spring season is kicking off a little later than usual to fit this season in. I think yeah. it's April 23rd for the yeah. spring sports. Yeah. Right. And we're going to be doing regularly doing the baseball games, which is something we haven't done, but we did a couple of the championship games a couple of years ago when, when the Beverly boys team was, uh, you know, they were going for the state title or, or semi semifinal games. So, yeah. well, I think our time is about up, uh, Mike. I want to, I want to thank you. Yeah. Your, and I'd like to remind our viewers that you have been watching city scene with mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. 
and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, Mike.